We're going to have Sing for Hope here today, ex sharing their experience of how they have been able to bring all that energy forth for social change. So this initiative is uh, co-hosted by Adelphi University, Goddess and Library, Teachers College, Columbia University, and by our presenters today, Sing for Hope. Today is our seventh presentation from a total of 14. So stay tuned for the upcoming ones as well. We hope to see you then. Um, just a shout out here on the room. We have Professor RG that is going to be also our co-MC with Dr. Nick, who you heard earlier. Sarah Avery is also in the house. Uh, Dr. Archer might be joining us also later on. Ms. Govan and of course our co-presenters um, today. They're also part of this initiative. Uh, the initiative took place uh, loosely from a book, Illuminations of Social Imagination. But at the end, the hope is for you, right there, you see me, right? Yeah, just for you to make that change, to be that change agent that we need in this world. So I hope that you're all engaged in this presentation, and I'll pass it to you. Dr. Lake, please take it away. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I am about to introduce today's student ambassador. And before I do that, I want to welcome any students who are interested and will be here next fall to contact me about being a student ambassador for the continuation of the Artivism series, which will go through December 2021. So if you're interested and you don't have to be a quote unquote artist in the typical sense, you can be anyone who does creative work or is inspired or has passion for uh, the arts, photography, uh, fundraising, doing theater, spoken word. It's as broad as you can imagine. So today we are delighted to introduce Nurjahan Khan, who goes by Asha. She is a senior and an undergraduate in the pursuing her BFA in studio art while minoring in music. Her academic experience is grounded in the liberal arts and humanities, which informs her own artwork, as well as her love and understanding of the arts of others. She is very excited to talk with you all a little bit about the work she's been involved with. So I would like to introduce Asha. Hi, thank you, Dr. Lake, for the introduction. And thank you so much for having me as the student ambassador for this event. So hi, everyone, I'm Asha. It's great to see you all here. And as Dr. Lick said, I am an artist and I'm currently working on my senior thesis. So my work is about creating chance happenings that encourage people that are passing by to stop and re-experience their surroundings. So personally, I've struggled a lot to connect to a lot of the works that are present in museums. So I can appreciate them and many of them I do enjoy a lot, but usually after I've you know, said my oohs and ahs, I kind of move on from them and that's the end of it but I've always thought that art that you experience, that anything you experience really is very powerful, um, as I think Sing for Hope will communicate to you shortly. So those are the types of artwork that resonate and more importantly stick for me. They're the ones that I remember. So when I tried to figure out what kind of art I wanted to make and what kind of people I wanted to speak to, I couldn't get away from the idea of experiential installation art. So my installations, um, which are constructions that are installed in a space, are site specific, so the location is relevant to what I make. Um, some of you may have seen them around Adelphi's campus this semester. Um, often the most important element of my installations is light, so which can you know dramatically change our perception of a location or the atmosphere. And the idea is that when you walk into or past this particular site, uh, the brick in the ordinary will kind of catch your attention so that you stop and go, ooh, what is that? So I'll do things like change the color or temperature of light that already exists in a place. So applying colored cellophane on windows or elevator lights or vending machines. Um, sometimes I'll introduce uh, sculptural forms to like accentuate existing light sources. And other times I'll bring in new light sources altogether, like installing small LEDs in like odd places. And so for me, what I think is transformative about installation art, um, especially that which is public and out of the museum or institution setting is that it becomes so much more accessible. Uh, you know, not everybody has the opportunity to visit museums and not everyone um, is interested in going to museums for a variety of reasons. And you know, not only that, but um, not everyone has a background in art making or art history to inform a lot of the great like paradigm works of art um, in museums. 
So when you stumble on an installation in public, even if it's just a small understated gesture, it's an experience that um, I like to think anyone can have. And so I like to think of art as a space rather than um, like a thing to observe or look at. It's something to experience or interact with, uh, something where the viewer becomes a participant and therefore part of the art itself. So for me, I'm really interested in that relationship between the participant and their encounter with my installations. You know, maybe they'll take that experience with them as a story to tell, you know, over dinner, or maybe they won't talk about it at all, but remember it when they pass that specific location again. And so for me, the art lies there in that memory or story of that, or that sensation of curiosity. So um, thank you for listening. That's enough about me. Um, I'd now like to introduce our fantastic presenter today, Ms. Yonis. So Monica Yonis is the co-founder and co-executive director of Sing for Hope. Ms. Yonis has performed with the world's leading opera companies, including the Metropolitan Opera, the Washington National Opera, the Zouk Festival, and in recitals in Spain, Guatemala, and her native Bangladesh. Um, my dad's also from there. <laughs> she has been named a 2016 Young Global Leader uh, of the World Economic Forum, honored with a 21st Century Leaders Award as New Yorker of the Week by New York One, and named one of the top 50 Americans in philanthropy by Town and Country. Uh, a leading voice in the Artists as Citizen discussion, she has performed and spoken at Fortune's Most Powerful Women Summit, Skoll World Forum, Aspen Ideas Festival, and the United Nations. The daughter of Nobel Peace Prize laureate Mohammed Yunus, Ms. Yunus is a graduate of the Juilliard School. Um, so Ms. Yunus, I'll hand it off to you now. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Asha. I really appreciate it. I'm already so inspired by everything that you just described about your own work, and I hope we can continue that conversation um, in future. In the future, uh, thank you, everyone. I'm really very happy to be here and very happy to be uh, having this conversation with all of you. Please, if you have any questions, I, I have set aside some time at the end there to to. Uh, make time so we can have a conversation. Um, but in the meantime, if things pop up, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat. Um, I also just want to send my my co-founders greetings. Um, anyway, she sends her greetings. I was very much looking forward to this discussion, but I will have to do it for both of us. Um, okay, so as singers, myself and Camille are operatic sopranos. Um, our work begins and ends with breath. Vocalized breath is the first indicator of human life, as any newborn's cry will tell you. This primal sound exists across all nations and eras. It connects us all, and it is as simple as it is profound. The universal awe. This pre-verbal connected state is what we tap into when we share art. It is this universal state, facilitated by the practice of art, that is a key component of communal healing and individual learning. It is why you all as creatives are quite literally our hope for the future. And it is this ideal that inspired the origins of Sing for Hope, the New York City based artist Peace Corps that Camille Zamora and I founded 15 years ago. I was definitely the kid that you could not shut up as a child. I sang in my driveway to the birds at the top of my lungs. My mom would take me to elder care facilities as a little kid to perform during the holidays and I started voice lessons at 11. I auditioned for the Metropolitan Opera Children's Chorus where I fell in love with opera. Growing up in New Jersey as the only Bangladeshi Russian gal I knew, I set my sights on being an opera singer. I don't think I really knew what that meant at the time, but it was very exciting to me. Um, and then I was in the stage that many of you all will remember. I started looking at colleges, conservatories, and I auditioned a lot. I ended up graduating from Juilliard with my undergraduate and then my master's, and I did a lot of summer programs in between, Aspen Music Festival, Boston University Tanguid Institute, and the Glimmerglass Festival. Um, I was also a student at Juilliard on 9-11. It was a watershed moment for all of us. Many people may not realize this, but Juilliard shares its city block with a firehouse on 66th Street and Amsterdam Avenue. And on that crisp September 2001, those firefighters were among the first responders on the scene. 12 of the 13 men who left their Lincoln Center firehouse that morning never returned. For Camille and myself, and for so many New Yorkers that day, in the surreal weeks that followed, the world seemed upside down. What had made sense only the day before no longer did, and emotions were very, very high. Not unlike what it is right now during COVID. 
for so many of us at Juilliard at the time, there was this consuming desire to try to move beyond the sanctum of our practice rooms and see if there was any way, any way that we could bring something of value to the chaos and the suffering outside of our school's doors. This impulse, if nothing else, a desire to mitigate our sense of powerlessness in that moment, led us to sing at the firehouse during that first nightmarish week. What astonished us was the effect that our simple songs had on the firefighters on duty and on the people gathered in front of that firehouse waiting for news of their loved ones next to a growing pile of flowers and handwritten messages. The music cleared an emotional pathway for them, allowing for the release of emotion and tears, which had been blocked until that moment. Um, in sharing our music on the street that day and in the months that followed at various firehouses throughout the city, we, reconnect, we reconnected with why we do what we do. And fast forward to today, what started as a couple of Juilliard Sopranos with an idea is now a 15 year old New York City based national organization serving millions. Our mission is to harness the power of the arts to create a better world. The act of sharing art in community has become an integral part of Camille's and my artistic career. And at this point in my life, I don't separate the two. It's not my career as a vocalist versus Sing for Hope. In my mind, they're very much intertwined. They inform each other. For me, it's become my heart's answer. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know why. That is oh. Sorry. OK, I'm sorry. I got a call there, and I had to just figure that out. Sorry about that. My apologies. <laughs> Never a dull moment these days. Excuse me. Um, so as I was saying that for me, Sync for Hope has become my heart's answer to my mind's question about audience development, cultural relevance, and the mystery that is the artistic process. We wholeheartedly believe in welcoming the arts to the table of social change along with politics and economics. Art is a change agent and a delivery system. And something as simple as a piano, an artifact of the 19th century here in the early days of the 21st can connect us and generate hope. At this point, I'd love to ask um, Carolina if she wouldn't mind uh, showing a little video that gives you a visual sense of all the things that I'm talking about. Thank you, Carolina. The pandemic has brought loneliness front and center, and so many are unable to connect with anyone. So we are reaching out to them. And we're supporting our community of Broadway stars, Grammy winners, and artists from the world's great stages at a time when the industry is 95% dark. Now more than ever, your contribution means everything to Sing for Hope and the artists and communities we serve. Thanks so much, Carolina. We have a slightly longer version of, of, of a bit more about us that we'll show you in a moment too. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. This just gives you the overview of sort of our programs at a glance, if you will. One second, please. No worries. No it's worries. Just the same one keeps coming up. One second. Please. The tech part of this is always the most fun. Oh Here we are. Well, while we're figuring that out, I'll just give you a little bit about a little bit about us again. Think for Hope harnesses the power of the arts to create a better world. Our creative programs bring hope healing and connection to millions of people in hospitals, 
care facilities, schools, refugee camps, transit hubs, and community spaces worldwide. This will do the trick. Okay. Sing for Hope mobilizes world-class artists who donate time and talent. Volunteer services that benefit schools, hospitals, and communities. Since 2006, Sing for Hope's programs have uplifted and inspired thousands of people in underserved schools, hospitals, veteran centers, and community organizations. To date, we have partnered with 250 nonprofit organizations, mobilized 3,500 artists in volunteer service, reached 40,000 school children, and placed 400 artist design pianos throughout our city's parks and public spaces, a symbol and celebration of art for all. We do believe that it is very important for young people to have an introduction to the arts. A lot of our young people have never really seen a real piano up front and center. So it's, it's amazing and it's fun to sit down with them and really play and, and see that energy and excitement. This year, thanks to a new partnership with the Department of Education, Sing for Hope is placing 50 pianos in 50 public schools across all five boroughs, bringing new harmonies into classrooms and benefiting an estimated 16,000 school children. As head of the New York City Housing Authority Youth Chorus, I've seen the difference that this organization makes in the life of young people. Sing for Hope brings a wealth of knowledge, talent, and education to young people. And the teaching artists that come from Sing for Hope really act as excellent role models. And it really makes a world of difference. I'm a praying man and I pray every day for the right help. And Sing for Hope is the right help. Where Sing for Hope fits in at Mount Sinai um, is that they bring what I can only describe as enlightened beauty to the lives of patients who are, for the most part, trapped in the hospital. It's more than just the art, um, the music, the dance, and the singing. They bring the compassion and the humanity because what they bring is people who perform. Not a television set that plays music, not an iPod or a radio, but an actual human being whose mere presence um, proves to our patients that they still matter, despite how dysfunctional healthcare is. Um, it proves to our doctors that the patients are human beings surrounded by a world of culture and art and beauty. I think this is the greatest public art project ever. Every day we look out, there's at least like a, a family of four or five people that are all playing. You could tell half of them have never played a piano before. You know, as soon as someone sits down and plays, everyone stops and gathers around and you have this sort of immediate, temporary moment of community. The Sing for Hope pianos transform New York City. For three weeks in the summer, there are these hot spots that are bringing people and communities to life. People are startled to see this colorful, crazy, beautiful instrument in the middle of a street. You don't expect a piano to be painted. You don't expect it to be out on the streets. And you'll walk up and you'll see this mini community in New York. Each January, we bring all 88 pianos into our studio. I've never seen 88 pianos in the same space. These artists, they're putting their heart and soul into these pianos. Dreams and nightmares and bird feathers layered on top of layers on top of layers. Playing with the physical presence of the piano. You feel the artist's investment in the piece. It's very moving. There are a lot of walls up between people and the consumption of art. So we're bringing the art to them. We're making art radically accessible to all. We break down that barrier, and they can touch it, and they can hear it, and they can experience it in a completely new way. And after their two weeks on the street, these pianos go on to live lives. They get to be placed in schools and in hospitals, and we send our artists into those spaces, and they do many performances and many master classes. You say, oh, you put a piano in the South Bronx, and people are going to destroy it, and that's not the case. This piano has challenged that stereotype because people can appreciate good things. We are worthy of this piano. First and foremost, music is uplifting. When you play music, you can find self-worth. Keeps the soul 
up high. It's good for you to, to be able to have the, that outlet. It gives me joy and it lets me know that I can give other people joy. Art is just an easy way for us to feel connected as humans. People will gather around it and people will interact. When you see it, you will stop and you will look at it. To see all those people come together, people who probably would have never noticed each other walking down the street, was inspiring. It's about the creative spark that lives in every person. The theme of Sing for Hope is art for all. It's about connecting people with the creative spirit that's inside all of us. Always nice to get a visual of, of that kind of uh, work. As I was saying before, Think for Hope was founded as a, an official nonprofit in New York City in 2006. And we partner with hundreds of community-based organizations, as you can see. Um, we mobilize thousands of artists in creative service, and we produce artist-created Think for Hope pianos across the US and around the world. Um, we champion art for all because we believe the arts have an unmatched capacity to uplift, unite, and heal. What does an organization like Sing for Hope do when every program you'd relied on being together and in person? I think I, it's safe to say that we are all adjusting to a year of change. Um, COVID has wreaked havoc on the world already in pain and has unveiled the deep, deep seated horrors of inequity and divisions in our society. Our art industry has also been ravaged with stages closed and arts organizations turned upside down. Um, according to Americans for the Arts, 63% of artists and creative workers are unemployed. That's 10 times the national unemployment rate. And yet the arts contribute $763 billion to the US economy, 4.2% of GDP, more than agriculture or transportation. So how does a nonprofit like Sync for Hope survive when our programs depend on in-person community engagement? Everything that we once did has had to be transformed. Um, Catalina showed the little 60 seconds of hope earlier that kind of highlighted that. Um, during this time, we have brought Sing for Hope pianos front and center. We, we had a partnership with, um, with Hudson Yards. We placed eight Sing for Hope pianos um, at Hudson Yards during the holidays with uh, sanitation stations and planned performances. Um, we've brought people like John Batiste to write directly to hospitals. We set up a Sing for Hope piano and and did performances and brought them directly to elder care facilities that we've worked with. And it's been a process of just revitalization and finding ways to, to give artists paid opportunities to create. Um, the, we have pivoted all of our virtual arts programming with the creation of Sync for Hope Healing Arts Interactive. This is a digital transformation that now allows us to enhance our pre-COVID reach by delivering our arts programming to anyone with internet access. Um, it's an opportunity because it's a win for artists because they're paid to create, a win for communities who enjoy the arts, and a win for the donors who support the Sync, Sync for Hope Interactive because their funds are driving impact. And it is particularly vital for residents of the nearly 31,000 nursing homes nationwide that have been locked down due to the virus and are only now just beginning to reopen. Seniors who face loneliness and depression, another, pan, another uh, epidemic that we're facing because they've been cut off from family and largely confined to their rooms. The Healing Arts Interactive features live interactive performances by talented artists from Broadway, the Metropolitan Opera and the world's leading stages. With a robust calendar offering at least three events a day, members enjoy a wide variety of music ranging from Broadway and jazz to classical gospel and world music, as well as museum tours, dance performances, readings, and so much more. Being interactive, the program allows members to speak to the performers, ask questions, and connect in a whole new way. In a digital world, Sync for Hope is no longer bound by location or in-person access, and no artist is either bound by location or even the boundaries of a stage. Healing Arts Interactive enables Sync for Hope to, to significantly further our core mission of arts for all. 
reaching individuals across the spectrum of independent living, assisted living, and skilled nursing care. It's a lifeline to arts programming, employment for artists, and it serves to spread the power of community, mental stimulation, and emotional release that only the arts can provide. So in a world where we're all waiting to get back to, nor to normal, I challenge you to think about creating a new normal. What do we know? We know that there's now enough data about the efficacy of integrating the arts into medical, educational, rehabilitative facilities, that if this were a traditional medicine, frankly, it'd be malpractice not to prescribe it. To take creative outlets away from our most vulnerable citizens at their most difficult life moments is at best cognitively dissonant, at worst, it's unethical. It just doesn't make sense. We know that this is rigorous work. In Anna Devere Smith's words, a lot of times we think art is about congratulations, but we rehearse things. We rough draft things as artists for the opportunity to correct and improve. And that area, the area of correction is where the education begins. Per the example of so many artists like Yo-Yo Ma, Damien Wetzel, Christina Pato, Questlove, Annie Lennox, to name just a few fellow travelers, citizen artistry demands fierce passion, technique, and focus. We know that so many of us, so many of us on this call even, are doing this. In addition to the 5,000 plus artists on the roster of Sing for Hope, there are countless great individuals and organizations sharing this path. Just take a look at the announcement for this incredible series. Just that, that's one example. And finally, we know that every time we make music, we create art, we feel in our very bones, once again, that familiar soul deep connection that it, that it is to create. And we feel once again that everyone deserves this. So my next question is, how, how do you do that, right? How do you start? Maybe you're saying to yourself, well, that's great. You have very fancy videos representing all these, you know, massive productions and donations and public private partnerships. But how do I, as a student or a community member, how, how do I do that? Um, well, I'm, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> start where you are. Start right where you are and start small. Everything you've seen us present, we started, it just started with an idea. I, I, can't, I can't stress that enough. I'm a firm believer in dreaming big and speaking loud, and it starts with you. Um, Camille and I have had plenty of people tell us no. So the first thing I would say is getting comfortable with the word no. Change can be tricky, but passion always wins out. We had people tell us that the world didn't need artists putting perfectly good instruments out in the streets. We worked hard. We asked a lot of questions. We, we wrote a lot of thank you notes and we listened, particularly to our, particularly to our community members. Um, I can't say that it's always been easy, but I can always say that it's absolutely worth it. So back to you. You're an artist, which by definition means you're an entrepreneur in my book. What is the definition of an entrepreneur? One who bears risk. And artists absolutely bear risk. So if you take nothing else away from this conversation, please hear me on this. Find out what's already going on in your community and get involved. There are many, many programs on campus and definitely around town that you can plug into. So do your research and don't rely solely on your professors to lead you to water. Figure it out yourself. You are responsible for driving your own journey as an artist and arts activist, and it starts right now. Talk to and use your community. Look to the right in the Zoom room. <laughs> Look to left in the Zoom room at the other students here all around you, your colleagues and your community. Get to know each other. These people are your team, not just in your sector, but the other sectors as well. Collaborate. The demands on all of our time is fierce, but you'll be so happy that you got to know people who are as passionate about this, about their discipline and about social change as you are about yours. They will become your lifelong friends and collaborators. Believe me, I speak from experience. Experiment with context, try stretching your wings, do things that scare you and maybe even try out something some like new repertoire in local communities or really wherever you are. And another thing, you probably already know this, but it bears repeating. Remember where you are and who you're privileged to work with. They will be an incredible resource for you. Nurture those relationships as students. You are utterly unique talent 
specific to you alone will be cultivated to its peak form while you're in school, while you're in community, and that's what you will leave delivering to the world. And remember this because the world needs you. It needs your light desperately. And I think it's so incredible to have an opportunity to speak with all of you today. And I wanna leave a little bit of time for questions and answers. So I'll, I will, uh, I will open, up, open it up now and, and see if we can have some time to converse. Actually, before we um, commence the Q&A, uh, we just want to ask that there's going to be a poll that shows up on your screen. Um, so just participate in that briefly. Um, and while you're doing this, I want to just announce the next uh, event in the Artivism series, which is the power of art, creativity, and academics. Um, that'll take place uh, next Monday, April 4th at 4 p.m., the same time as this one. Um, and for more information on that, uh, as well as the rest of the uh, events in the series, uh, please go to the website adelphi.edu forward slash artivism or follow us on Instagram, artivism for share humanity. I'm putting those in the chat right now. Instagram uses the number, not the word. Um, yeah, or you can just Google Adelphi and artivism. Uh, we're also hoping, ho excuse me, <laughs> we're also hosting an open call art installation for all the creative thinkers on our Instagram. So. If you want to get more involved in this year-long initiative, uh, please contact Dr. Stephanie Lake or Carolina Cambronero. They're both in the meeting right now. Um, and now we can open up the floor for questions. Uh, please use the raise hand feature uh, on Zoom. And then to ask a question, you can unmute yourself or you can ask it in the chat. So thank you. OK, any questions or comments? I have one. What's that? I said, don't be shy. Oh, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> um, how does an organization partner with you? How does an organization, it depends on what kind of partnership you're seeking. We're open to um, just send us an email and we can we can chat. I think right now things are, I, I'll be totally transparent. Things are, are, um, are interesting, you know, as a nonprofit, we are still trying to fundraise and we're still trying to do, you know, reach the communities that we have um, reached before the pandemic. Um, so we are constantly reinventing ourselves, um, but we are always excited to hear from community members. And um, if there's a way to partner, we're, we are open to it. I mean, if not partner, even just collaborate a little, give some insight, I guess, because we do have two guests here. Uh, one is Alejandro Torres from the Luis Zaida organization, and the other is uh, Cecilia uh, Venosta Weigel from the Center for Women of New York. Um, one is the, um, I believe, Lower East Side. The Center for Women of New York is in Fort Taunton in Queens. Um, so they're both working hard, doing great things, and um, may be interested in um, some of your insight. That would be great. Yeah, I'd love to set up a call or another another time to kind of get to know each other and, and see where where our interests intersect and how we can collaborate. That would be wonderful. I'd like to follow up with a question on the chat and perhaps a little interaction from the audience members here. Come on, like Ms. Juno said, don't be shy. This is the moment to show our passion. I like um, just to you know, like, let's experience our passion. So like, Nur Jahan, I know you mentioned a little bit about your work and your passion, but in one word, how would you ignite the audience tonight for action? Um, could you repeat that? Sorry, I couldn't really hear you that well. Just one word or one, one idea to ignite the audience tonight for, pa for their passion so that they can start becoming the artivists that we need in the world. I think if I had to give it, I, I guess in a phrase more than a word is, what else did not do for you? Make the art that you wished existed that maybe doesn't. Mm. That's very powerful. What about you, Ms. Janus? Yeah, I love that. I mean, I, I think that that's incredibly powerful and something that, you know, 
oh, comes to mind for me is that, you know, we're all so unique. There's no other one person as you. So your only challenge is to be the best you you can be. And, you know, I think one way to do that is through your art, through one's art, through one's creative access. And I think you don't have to be quote unquote, an artist, you know, you don't have to feel that you are, you have that label to be creative. Everyone is creative. I hold that very strongly. Everyone is creative. Um, in the chat, we have a comment from Irini Linerdaki. She's from Greece. She's probably was past midnight there. Oh my as goodness. Is, hey, as, hey. as is uh, Yorgos Makakis. Um, Irini says, fight the fight. That's yes. it. I like that. Yeah. So basically, we can start it going by like, you are the change agent. Each one of us has it within. And like Ms. Yunus said, we all have the resources that we need at hand. It's just a matter of how we're putting them into action, right? Um, Absolutely. Carolina, if I may say so, um, hi. Hey, welcome. Thanks for getting <laughs> up so late. Yeah, well, I told Argie sometimes I fall asleep before you guys start. But, um, <laughs> what, fight the fight, yes, of course. And fight the fight is basically repeating a word to say, okay, this is it, right? So if you're an artist and you're an activist and you're a poet and you're a musician and you're a mom, you know, and you're a student, but be all that in one. Don't divide, you know, don't divide your force. You're all that at once, you know. If you're an artist, channel everything. There's no artist slash activist. It's one thing, you know, be everything. This way we're stronger, you know. That's right. That's right. I love that. I love that. Oh, thank you for staying up late with us. <laughs> Anyone else from the audience? Maybe from the Loisaida project? I actually have a question. I... Um, Chime in. Uh, I have a question. Um, I was wondering, uh, how did Sing for Hope, I guess, look in like 2006 when you started versus now? Or I guess pre-COVID now, uh, you know, like how has it evolved since then? Yeah, that's a great question, Asha. I think, again, I cannot stress to you enough how much of this was Camille and myself on our computers or writing in notebooks ideas that we thought and, you know, as wild as, it, as we could be and as audacious as we could be, we were very good about asking for meetings from people, um, you know, you inspire me and I'd like to sit down and you know can I pick your brain for 10 minutes and that was something I I feel like the first couple years was a lot of that because we couldn't really articulate what it was we were going to do you know we we had an idea we were very inspired by what had happened um you know post 9-11 as students we knew we didn't want to spend just countless hours on our craft it felt really um felt very limiting at that time and again you know I'm, I'm I'm, I'm looking back, you know, as, as somebody who's kind of charted this, this path for this organization. But I think, you know, at the time we were, I have to say, we're very confused. I, I didn't have a clear plan. That's the really, that's the, that's the reality of it. I think when you're sort of trying to create something from nothing, you don't necessarily know the structure or how it's going to work out. We were very, very lucky to have conversations with some wonderful people who were very wise and, and enjoyed nurturing the birth of an organization, really and truly. Um, I still um, have weekly chats with a board member who's in her 90s, who is just one of these incredible, fierce women. Her name is Ava Holler, and she particularly loves launching organizations. And she would chide us and say, listen, ladies, you can't, you can't do this one email at a time. You have to get, give it a structure. You have to start to figure this out. Let me help you build a board. And we're like, no, no, no. We, we you know, we, we have, we, no, we don't need to do that. We're just going to get artists together. And we're going to, you know, we're going to have them share their art in spaces. And she was, <laughs> she really sort of um, gave us some focus and gave us some real um, tools with which to begin to envision something larger than just the two of us writing emails at night, you know, and I think it was very, very important to have those kinds of conversations because through the telling of your vision to other people, you hone exactly what it is you're trying to present. 
and that's extremely helpful because they're speaking through your art and then there's sort of a narrative version that sometimes has to go along with that if you're trying to convey a vision. Thank you for that question, I appreciate it. One other thing I'll just put in the chat right now. Um, if any, I believe starting today, or maybe maybe it's sometime this week, I think, vaccinations open up in the state of New York for anyone under th over 30, is that right? I believe. So anyway, I'm, I'm putting that in, in case you have the chance to get your vaccine during a certain time period. I don't know how it works. Um, you can sign up and at Javits Center, we have seven day week programming with artists. We are paying incredible musicians to uh, soothe that somewhat strange time of going and getting your vaccine. So at the Javits Center, you can get vaccinated and you can listen to incredible music making at the same time. Um, it's we're, we're super, we're super excited about it, and if you are, um, if you are lucky enough to get your vaccine sometime soon, we are delighted and hope that you will check out the music. It is not canned music; that is live music <laughs> with live people who are very, very excited to be performing right now. So, just um, just so you're aware, and if, if if you do have to go to Javits for that reason, maybe between 11:30 and, and one o'clock is a good time. Any other questions or comments? Thank you so much for supporting musicians. I have a lot of musician friends. I am a musician. Really, really hard time for a lot of us. Um, it's unbelievably hard to practice when you don't have a gig. It's very, very difficult. So I thank so you so it. much for that. I so get it. And I think, you know, it, it's not an answer, but it's a part of what like I said before it's just a, it's it's one tool and it's incredible to hear these artists make music right now and I just want to encourage everyone on the on the call today to to keep doing that art whatever it is and and I know it's difficult because I too literally sometimes find I can't find my voice <laughs> during this pandemic but it's so important and even if it's just turning on a tune and singing along or playing something that, you know, feels like home. I think it's super, super important. And I, you know, I want to gently challenge everyone to do that, including myself. <laughs> On that note, I wanted to ask a question to the audience. Well, not a question, just like a, a comment, I guess. And to you, Ms. Janus, and all. Have you experienced what comes through the eyes of people when they're listening to your music? And how does that have the repercussions in their everyday life thereafter? Could anyone in the audience comment on that a bit, maybe? I mean, I can't comment on it in that I know what, it, what that feels like, but um. Uh, I, I've done a lot of projects where we sing at like uh, retirement homes, where we create, I, I believe with Norfolk, there's the Calming Murals project. I've participated in that a few years. I've done projects where you make uh, holiday cards for hospitals and um, the the feeling of gratitude that you get from that, like even if you don't, if, even if it's not verbal, like you can see in that moment how much it means to them. There's really no way to explain it other than to experience it. So um, if you have a chance to do anything like that, it's really, really worthwhile and gratifying. I'm letting audience members chime in before commenting. I think music touches the soul. Okay. And, when, and when a singer feels the music that they're performing, you don't, you could just leave your eyes closed. You don't even need to look at the audience because if you feel it, you know that they're feeling it. And it's just so, it's really a precious, precious thing if you've ever experienced it. You're here.
Yeah, I'll just say it's like sharing soul to soul. You know, it's it's something that you can't really describe because it's so, um, it's such a unique thing. And when you see that you can have that effect, it's it's pretty it's pretty exciting. You want to have that effect again and again. <laughs> you know, that's the beauty of music. It's a language, the beauty of the arts and and music. It's one of those things that everybody understands on what I think a soul is a soul level. I think, okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I think it's also could be very enlightening if you're talking about performance um, for social change. You can also enlighten people so that they understand certain things maybe that for whatever reason they weren't exposed to or didn't understand before. Absolutely. So it could be, it could be very purposeful too. Yes. Jeremiah Bornfield said, um, I've had that experience before. To me, it's something always unexpected and unpredictable. Hmm. And like I was saying, you know, some people have not the opportunity to be in an art classroom. They have not the opportunity to be in a concert. Perhaps they have had it in a different style, right? But the question here is, are they being able to relate their self as we had during our conversation, that self-worth through the arts? And as we know, this is a human right. That in various places in the world is not being held up to. And what does that do to the person when you don't have the opportunity to express or see yourself of reflected in the arts, in your culture, in your experiences. You feel very much muted. No, I think it's ironic that during this time, the phrase that keeps coming up to me again and again is you're, you're muted, which is so funny. And yet, because we're all so familiar with Zoom, and I know we've all said that to somebody at least once during this pandemic, you're muted. And it feels that way. It literally feels that when you cannot express yourself, that you are, you are very much muted, and that self-expression has been, you know, cut off. And like some some people say, we have to give them the voice, right? Like they, somebody has to speak. This no, it's their voice is there. That it's like they're not voiceless, right. but rather is that we're not listening to their voice. So how can we create those platforms to listen to everyone's voice? I think communal art making is a great start. Any other comments? I want to know what where do you get these pianos? How do you deliver them? Do they stay at their destination or do they rotate communities? How does all That's that a work? Question. We have a 500 page manual that answers everything <laughs> you ever wanted to know, including how do you load the synchro pianos up on the trucks because delivery in New York City is its own challenge. Um, each piano, each synchro piano goes to a specific site within the five boroughs. And then they're out in the parks and public spaces for two to three weeks, depending on the iteration that we're doing. And then they come back to our synchro pianos warehouse space and then are delivered to um, schools. And they are their forever homes, which is great. And we have uh, piano buddies who take care of the synchro pianos when they're out. Um, they have they come equipped with tarps and the piano buddies get texts that say hey it's it's gonna rain today please go cover up your sink for whole piano and so they go out and they cover it and there's a bungee cord that sort of wraps around it and uh, you know we've seen we've seen those intrepid pianists who come out anyway and sort of like try to like get under the tarp to play in the rain um, it's it's really something unexpected and unpredictable and whimsical and you know, there's very few things that 
have, get people to stop in New York City and sort of check in with one another. This is this is one of those projects that does just that. Um, and as far as where we get the pianos, um, it's it's actually not the the hardest part of the project because so many people are either donating a, a, a piano or, you know, to be honest, we can't even keep up with that um, because they have to be of a certain quality in order to be outside for a certain amount of time and then also be in a forever home. So it's not the kind of thing where we're actively looking for donations of pianos. Um, occasionally we'll be able to accept one because they are quite large and um, it's not the cost of the pianos, it's actually the cost of moving them. That's the big line item in the budget because you have to, you know, get them to the piano studios atelier, get them to their spots, move them back, have them tune, and then move them again to their their forever homes. So it's quite a process, and the the, the process, generally speaking, is is really year round, you know, because we we have an RFP process, and then we have an adjudication panel that has you know incredible. Um, people that are not me and Camille <laughs> that deals with sort of looking through these incredible proposals and then letting the artists know that they can, um, that they've been selected to create one. There's anywhere from a six week to three month process where they create the Sing for Hope piano. And then, as I said, they have to go to the various places. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's an enormous uh, logistics puzzle. So if somebody wanted to get one for their like neighborhood, I guess, or their organization or, you know, uh, an event in a park or an opening someplace or on campus, you know, what do they do? Is there an application process? Is there? Yep, we have an application process and we have a whole sort of system for how, how it works out depending on, you know, what they're seeking and then different partnerships. Um, you know, this, this will be an unusual year with synchro pianos where we're still sort of waiting to see what what's going to happen just with the guidelines and gatherings and things like that. So um, I think we're very, very happy that during a time in the in the holiday season, at the end of the year, we were able to place synchro pianos at, at, at Hudson Yards, which were publicly accessible and, you know, safe according to guidelines and still have people who were able to sort of sign up and say, I'm going to be there at this time, I'm going to play have people in between wiping them down because again we don't want to be part of the right the contagion spread so it's been you know um, a tremendous effort on everyone's part to make sure that that you still have that whimsy and you still have that uh, wonderment but it's safe i don't know i would love to paint one <laughs> oh, i would love to paint and one. i got an rfp for you <laughs> 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 not just me I would love to have like some of my students just you know do they have a collaborative kind of yeah that uh, would be wonderful yeah we'd love that, that would be that would be great that would be yeah. great That'd yeah. be maybe someday. it'd be a great project for the arts festival at Adelphi that we have like that could be something really fun yeah that'd be great I yeah I welcome it We're covering so much and we're coming close to time. Um, it's going to be hard. It's a tough question for you, Ms. Genius, but just give us a couple of takeaways. couple. I know we can go on and on, but just a couple for our audience. And let's make them like action ones. So, you know, something that will really be like, you know, tomorrow I'm going to start my day. You know, I think, um, again, it's a, it's a challenge, right? I think it's very hard right now to feel motivated. And I'm just going to acknowledge that because it is difficult. So I, again, start small, even if it's waking up in the morning and setting an intention or doodling or taking some paint and just, you know, using the brush strokes or singing a song every day at a certain time, start small, because again, you, it has to come from within yourself. So uh, that's that's where I would start again. So I, I do want to hear and honor the fact that it is difficult. And from my artist community, that is what I'm hearing. Um, and on the, on the total other side of the spectrum, I'm also hearing, oh, I've never had this much time to just sort of focus in this particular way and I'm getting more work done. And then that puts more pressure on the people that are feeling like they can't get anything done. So it goes both ways. So I think if you can sort of set something that's realistic for you, and I can't tell you that, 
but you can sort of look within yourself and say, I, I know I can commit to that. Um, I think that's really important. And that, that is a huge step. It may seem very small, but it's, it's, a, it's, lar it's a large one in the scope of things because you're committing to that. And it's actionable. And do you do work in other countries? Yes, we have Sing for Hope pianos in Greece, as I mentioned. Ah, you do. Well, yeah, that, that's my friend, George. Yes, I just yeah. saw that. And I, we'll have to connect so I make sure I have people's, um, the right contact information. So yes. Uh -huh. um, and we have a Sing for Hope piano in Beirut, Lebanon, wow. at the American University of Cancer Center, which blissfully somehow escaped uh, from the horrific blast that they had last summer. Um, it is still making music in that center, the, which I'm just so incredibly grateful for. Um, and yeah, we definitely, we have a, a synchro piano at the Kennedy Center in DC uh, at the Reach. Um, we have a synchro piano in London at a gallery in London. Um, so yes, the short answer is yes. Oh, wonderful. I'm taking note of this. There he goes. Yeah, you got his email? Yes. Sometimes the, the, the Zoom ends and then I'm like, but I didn't get the information. Yorgo is great. He works for public radio in Greece. Uh, he studied in uh, Sweden, um, went back to Greece, and he's been all over the world. Um, and his passion is music. There he is. Hi, Yorgo. Oh, hello. Tell, tell them a little bit about your work uh, with your music. Here goes the face. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. 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 It's. I mean, it's uh, amazing to to be able to get the pulse from other other places around the world because I mean, this very democratic virus has caused you know to everybody around the globe the same effects, you know, the same troubles, you know, and it's interesting to see how differently you act, how you interact and how you're working in order to surpass these obstacles, these hindrances, you know, that they're in front of you. And um, it's amazing to be able to see how you energizing, how you, you create this platform, because uh, uh, we are not usually uh, get this feeling, you know, that the, the, the artists, especially opera singers, you know, we have them up on the, plateau on the palcosenico you know singing and you don't expect them to be so you know vibrant and creative and with energy and um, for me it's it's interesting usually you you have the pop stars but i mean uh, around greece and around europe we have usually the, this this issue that when they the, the the big stars they create these platforms Honestly, they do it, you know, for getting a benefit on themselves, you know, to, to get publicity, you know. Did you follow me? I hope you... Yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah. No, no, I understand. I understand. So for me, you, 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 I can sense, you know, the, the, the genuinity in this project of yours. I can sense, you know, by seeing 50, 60 pianos. I can't remember the exact number, you know, and paint them, you know, something. It's actually... Today, today I had this, this thing I said to a friend about about his car. Do it as Paul McCartney, John Lennon, buy a Rolls Royce and paint it, you know, from outside, so it looks like, like quotidien, you know, like every. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> so um, I have to uh, to be to, to say I'm sorry, RG. I, my show runs right now, and I exactly I have to listen to because there are certain issues. But uh, I will definitely come to to Monica. Thank Everything you. okay, and thank you. thank you for hosting. And this is brilliant, brilliant, uh, uh yeah, initiative, you know. Yeah. Thank you. We will definitely connect. And this is such a great group to, to be connected with. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye, bye, guys. Bye bye. And that's also part of this um, initiative of Artivism to do just this to keep on expanding that network because, in the numbers, is also the power, right. Absolutely. So let's start coming together, expanding, and supporting one another.